back for class reunions year after year. Why do Princeton men keep coming back? What is it that keeps this loyalty alive? It's not just for good fellowship that they return, nor is it simply to revisit the old familiar places. It's not for the quiet dignity of the famous campus, nor for the architectural beauty of its buildings. Yet each vista conjures up a chain of memories, and even the strips of pavement have names and significance. Stone itself can come to life when it is a symbol of the things live men have done or hope to do. What nourishes the ivy through the years and keeps it fair and firm is something that went into the soil along with the seed, for age alone does not hallow a tradition. To each succeeding generation of students, old Nassau represented something new. Today they see it as they first saw it. They see it as a symbol of their youthful hopes. Just as they see in the dormitories a reminder of their student days, of classmates who became friends, of a spirit of learning to live with equals in an atmosphere of cordial rivalry and brusque affection. The highlights of a Princeton memory can include the hubbub of a battle with the sophomores or the serenity of the campus dusk. Bright lights glowing through the leaded panes, the good cheer in crowded bull sessions. The fun of doing things together. The occasion might have been the rally for a football game, now forgotten. But it is the single song that rose from all the voices, the common thought in all the minds, the one rhythm in all the hearts that is remembered for a lifetime. Remembered, like the warmth of the sun on a brisk November afternoon, or the bustle of students and visitors on their way to a big game. Feelings can be remembered long after the game itself has been forgotten. Whom did we play that day? Does it matter? As long as we cheered ourselves hoarse, as long as we gave as good as we took, as long as we could sing to the honor of our side at the game's end. The day after, we showed our parents the new chapel. We can still remember the pride we felt in acting as guides to them. Or perhaps we remember the academic splendor of Princeton's 200th birthday celebration. The most illustrious leaders of our time had come to be honored by Princeton. But in their very coming, they had paid a tribute to the university's position in international learning. As the President of the United States crossed the campus in New Jersey that afternoon, he was accompanied by a predecessor and surrounded by the leaders of the nation. These men, statesmen, warriors, scientists, had just led a world to victory over the enemies of truth. How fitting that part of their victory celebration should be a tribute to an institution celebrating two centuries of devotion to that truth. It was a procession where men of action walked side by side with men of learning in the realization that only by working together could they make sure that peace would bring happiness to the peoples who had fought for it. Men of learning. The line was long, for behind the leaders came the men who had trained some of them for leadership. The Princeton faculty, the teachers, the first part of that unique combination that makes Princeton. What is a teacher? Knowledge first acquired over many years the wit and wisdom of a developed mind that can give of itself without losing anything, that grows indeed in the very act of giving. 
or facts, carefully selected and ordered into a useful tool for living and working, or feeling, just as carefully ordered into the strengths and talents that can make for beauty. Or spiritual wisdom, insight into the motives and aspirations of mankind, the kindness and patience that are the teacher's first gifts. Finally, it is the specialized technique of sharing all these things with generation after generation of students. Students, they make up the second half of the combination. At Princeton, this half is rich in variety. Every section of the country and many foreign lands are represented. They come from every social group, every religion, from high schools and prep schools. Princeton doesn't try to press them into a common mold, but rather encourages them to develop as individuals. It offers them all the same opportunity to learn and to develop the ability to give what they know to their own community. They have been selected carefully for the promise of such giving. What holds their interest outside the classroom reveals the full measure of their variety. For some, it is the quality of the campus itself, the setting in which they live and work. For many, it is the athletic facilities close by the living quarters, playing fields where hundreds of students can find room for exercise. Beside the large number who participate in intercollegiate sports, 85% of the Princeton undergraduates take part in the program of intramural athletics. The choice of the sport is left to the students. Most students are interested in the changing face of the ageless campus. Behind their traditional facades, the new buildings reflect a modern spirit. The new library is the last word in the functional use of space, equipment, and material. It makes books more accessible and provides a better setting for study and relaxed reading. These halls may be a preview of how Princeton will look in her third century. Another sign of our times is the opportunity that an undergraduate now has to learn how men explore the universe with cyclotron and telescope. Undergraduate. At Princeton, it means a man, not a boy. It means someone who is held responsible and someone who is respected. Perhaps of all Princeton institutions, the one most symbolic of the relationship between teacher and student is the honor system. In lieu of being supervised by a proctor, the student writes on every examination paper, I pledge my honor as a gentleman that during this examination, I have neither given nor received assistance. The system works because the students take direct responsibility for making it work. This is the combination with both its parts. Teachers who keep increasing their knowledge and sharpening their minds, and their students bent on acquiring that knowledge and learning how to use it. It is an older man and a younger man whose relationship is based on mutual respect. It's a good way of opening windows to the world. It's been working at Princeton ever since this bell first signaled the hours of the college day. Some 20 years before the Revolutionary War, the first generation of students used this room as a prayer hall. Perhaps it was here that they first learned the principles of freedom for which they later fought there has been a close connection between America's history and Princeton's history. America's first president visited Nassau Hall when the Continental Congress was sitting there. The college's charter was granted by an English king. But to the war against that king, Princeton not only provided fighters, but also a battleground and a rallying point. The men who founded the college and shaped its policy, men like Jonathan Dickinson, and like Aaron Burr, were also shaping the policy of the little nation that was to grow big. They were teaching men like James Madison, who was to frame the constitution of our country. Three signatures beneath the Declaration of Independence indicate Princeton's part in the making of that historic manifesto. They include John Witherspoons, the college's president during the revolution. 
Later on in the war between the states, John McLean's students fought for their ideals on both sides. While the students of James McCosh took part in the vast development of the American continent that followed. It was McCosh who laid the foundations for the university. But then, as now, the same men taught both graduate and undergraduate students. Never has a teacher at Princeton been considered too wise or too important to address a freshman class. In fact, Woodrow Wilson went far afield to get more teachers to supervise undergraduate study. With his preceptorial method, he did much to formulate the attitude of mutual respect between teacher and student. The installation of a Wilson Memorial Room in the new library was supervised personally by Harold Dodds, his present successor, who has repeatedly expressed his devotion to the ideals of one of America's most honored teachers. How Wilson's ideas and ideals are maintained in our own time makes the latest chapter in Princeton's history. We can see it for ourselves. On the steps of the sundial, sacred to members of the senior class, is a group of young men who will soon be leaving Princeton. Let's stop and meet them. Richard Arkwright is from the Middle West. Michael Salter is from Texas. George Parker Hammond came from a Boston family. William Ackland Brown's home is Baltimore. Together, these four are the product of Princeton. Three and a half years ago, when Bill was first admitted to Princeton, he felt pretty lucky. The son of a newspaper editor, he was a serious lad who considered himself quite a thinker. Princeton to him was a great treasure house and he expected automatically to be given the key to it. He thought his own role was merely to fill up on the wisdom and tradition around him. Philosophy was all he really wanted to study. Princeton, however, requires that freshmen begin with a well-rounded program. So Bill chose physics as his required science course. Not that he was interested in physics, it was too practical. Watch the point up while I hang these equal weights on the spring. There's none. One. Another. Another. There are loads. One, two, three. Look at the marks. What's the story about the stretches? Stretch is proportional to the load. You know, Mr. Hook was simply delighted when he discovered that, because it shows something clear and simple about nature. We call that relationship Hook's Law, and we can show it on a graph with a straight line like this. When we say springs obey Hook's Law, we don't mean obey like a man in a car obeying a policeman. Scientific laws don't compel agreement. They give a clear summary. Bill heard the words of that lecture, but because of his attitude, he was not prepared to understand them. It wasn't until the next day in the laboratory that he made real contact with the professor's ideas. All uh, right, sir, uh, my experiment has gone wrong. What do you mean? Well, I, I've loaded my spring with more and more weight, and with the heavier load, the spring doesn't obey Hooke's law. Does that make your experiment wrong? Well, yes, yes. See, uh, the last two points on my graph here are wrong. Wrong? Do you want to compel nature to be simple and obey Hooke's law? Well, no, but the book says that springs do obey Hooke's law, and you showed it in lecture. Which are you really going to believe? Your measurements here, or the line which shows Hooke's law? Oh, the straight line, of course. Don't you trust your own measurements? Well. I... These measurements are facts. They are your scientific work. They rank with Hook's work and everyone else's in the study of springs. Why don't you load up your spring more? Then you will see if those points were mistakes. You mean go farther with the spring? Of course. Find out all you can and build your knowledge on real experiment. Why don't we look at someone else's graph? You see, he gave his spring a terrific workout and plotted the facts. Now he knows that Hooke's law only applies within limits. You know, you want to experiment boldly. You trust your own observations. Then you have to think about what they really mean. And then your lab work here will be worth a lot to you. You mean all this is, is just as important as the physics I learned? 
Good heavens, this experimenting is your physics. Physics around here doesn't just tell you how pulleys work or spin romantic stories about atoms. It shows you what scientific work is really like. It raises questions about the meaning of truth. It makes you think about your own knowledge. That day, Bill began to learn that thinking is weak and unsure unless one examines the evidence on which it is based. The professor had not given him a magic key to a treasure house, but he had given him an implement to test and increase his knowledge. Bill learned to use it and is going on using it for the rest of his life. Michael Salter was in his sophomore year when a teacher played an important part in his growth. In Mike's case, it was a personal rather than an academic problem that was troubling him. Mike was one of the large number of boys at Princeton who were working their way through. His mother ran a bookshop in Dallas, and there wasn't much of her income that could be spared for tuition and living expenses. But by working in commons as a waiter, Mike managed to make both ends meet. The job was strenuous, but it left him plenty of time for his studies and for extracurricular activities too, for Mike was beginning to show more than usual talent in the arts. He became interested in scenic design and was soon helping to provide sets for campus productions. Here he could work with his hands and with his head and his talents too. He knew when a set was right and better still, how to get it right. But on decisions affecting his own life, he found the going a little tougher. Now at the end of his sophomore year, he had to make a definite choice about the department he would work in. He always thought it would be English, but well, there were problems. Then came the time for a meeting with his faculty advisor, who happened, by chance, to be an English teacher. And you're sure that you still want to major in English? Yes, I'm sure. It's got to be English. You see, I want to be a writer, and as I say it, I ought to take the shortest distance between two points. I've got to learn how yes, to write. But, Mike, what about these grades in English? Well, I guess I just didn't settle down to work. That's part of the point. What do you want to write, Mike? I don't know. Essay? Poetry? I don't know. Well, how do you know you want to write? Well, I've always wanted to be a writer. Mike, you like this head, don't you? I'll say I do. I've admired that head ever since I came to Princeton, sir. And that article in the Kenyon Review on W.H. Arden, I think you said you liked that, too. Why, sure. Well, which of those two would you rather have done? I mean, you yourself, inside. The head, of course. And you still think you want to be a writer? My mother used to say that... Look, Mike, from what you've told me about your mother, I'd gather that she lives in a world of books, and because authors are at the top of that world, she'd like you to be an author. But I'll bet you that if she knew how much you wanted to major in graphic arts, she'd be the first to say, go ahead, Mike. Yes, but I've got to start thinking about making a living. You're just talking yourself out of what you want most in the world. Why don't you go over to the counseling service tomorrow and find out about careers in a world where you really have something to give, Mike? The counseling service could tell him about jobs in architecture, in the theater and in motion pictures, in visual education and in museum administration jobs that paid well. With the help of the service, he was able to begin right at Princeton, for the University Art Museum could use his combination of energy and good taste. He's done well in the Department of Art and Archaeology, and he's going on to study architecture. In finding a career, Mike found himself. Dick Arkwright rarely had troubles, and if he did, he could usually push his way through them. He relied on toughness and his own particular way with people, but it was a way that made him as many enemies as friends. Fellow members of the swimming team and members of the football squad, with which he played in the fall, relied on his muscles, but often they didn't care for his manner. He tended to be cocky and dogmatic, possibly because he wasn't very sure of himself. Then one day in his junior year, a skillful history preceptor brought him face to face with his problem. The preceptorial is a regular classroom function at Princeton in which a teacher meets with a handful of students in an informal way. Today's assignment was the Thirty Years' War. Dick began with his usual bluster. 
Oh, no, all wars are fought for economic reasons. Any other reasons are wrong. Uh, would you say that was true of the last World War, Arkwright? No ideologies involved? All I know is my brother didn't fight for any ideology. He fought because he was drafted. Maybe so, but the men in the army would have revolted if they hadn't believed they were fighting for something. The Nazis certainly believed they were fighting for something. They were fanatics for National Socialism. Well, that's an ideology, isn't it? Something you might fight for? Well, sure. But, sir, you know there were economic factors in the last war. Were there? Well, I think so. And the Thirty Years' War was no different. That's right. Now tell us what were the causes of the war. All right. Uh, uh, well, first, the Habsburgs controlled Germany, and they didn't want anyone to take it away from them. The leaders on both sides used religion as an excuse to cover up their ambitions. Go on. Well, in the second place, the French were killing off Protestants at home, but they thought nothing of making an alliance with Protestant Germany. Kill them at home and love them someplace else. Well, that does seem inconsistent, doesn't it? How do you explain it? Uh, they wanted to get the Catholic Habsburgs out of Germany so they could take over. Well, then the Thirty Years' War was caused by good, hard-boiled imperialism. Does everyone agree? Wait a minute, sir. I'm not finished yet. Sweden entered the war to make the Baltic Sea a Swedish lake. Do you call that religion? Well, then, Arkwright has made his case, has he? No, sir. Arkwright made some good points. But there was a religious issue, too. The Calvinists emphasized the Bible, and the Catholics believed in the church. But why fight about that? Because salvation was very important. A man worried as much about his soul in those days as he does now about where his next meal is coming from. Only in those days? Well, it may be true today, too. Remember what we said about the Nazis. Well, people who fight for democracy, too, I suppose. It's all pretty complicated. Ideals and economics get all mixed up in politics. I'm right, and Green is, too. The discussion went on, but Dick had learned that a person could be wrong without losing dignity. He had learned he didn't have to push people around to make them believe him. After that lesson, he got along better with teachers and students both, and he's going to get along with his business associates next year. George Hammond's personality never needed help. From the day he came to Princeton, he was a success both in class and on the campus. By the time he had reached his senior year, he had the admiration of teacher and fellow student alike. In Whig Hall, where the Princeton Senate now holds its sessions, George could always be counted on for a speech where good sense was expressed in clear and forceful words. He could write with the same ease and facility. He started as a reporter on the undergraduate daily, but moved up to become managing editor. He looked forward to writing a thesis on labor relations, which would be the major assignment of his last year at college. But his plans had to be approved by his supervisor. You must have worked hard to build this up. Good bibliography, too. I like your idea of interviewing union leaders and the company industrial relations. Well, when you've done what you have planned here, what do you have? A well-written thesis. I wouldn't be interested in reading it. But why? What's the matter? You won't be writing what you've learned at first hand. That's what's the matter. But I thought you just said I that... said you had compiled a good list of books, but what you will write will be what someone else has already written. But I'll do a lot of reading, and I'll learn something about the industry. Uh, certainly, and that's worthwhile, but it's not enough for you with your ability and with this kind of a subject. Uh, look, Hammond, what do you do when you have to write a story for the Princetonian about something that's going on around here right now? Well, I go out and cover it. Precisely. You go out and see for yourself. What are you doing this summer? I'm going to France with Jim Parks. There's a chance I may get a job on the Paris Herald. Sounds attractive, but you're not out yet. You have an assignment before that, this thesis. What do you mean, sir? I mean cover it. From the inside, not merely from the books and the documents, find out for yourself about labor relations. You know one side of it, uh, from your father and his friends. Why not find out the other side by getting into it? Get in all over, feel it, taste it. Get your story that way and it will be really your story, not a rewrite. That's one reason we have a work-study program here. Why is it that the hard way so often seems best? George wasn't pleased with the change in plans, but he took the professor's advice. That summer found him far from the boulevards. 
he managed to get a job as a timekeeper at an oil refinery instead. With his gift for success, he soon learned to do the chores that were expected of him. The men with whom he worked came to like him because he was able to make himself one of them. They didn't know he was a college student, but they knew he was a bright boy who could understand their problems and see their point of view. He came to know what they wanted out of life and what they were willing to do to get it. He came to know what the men felt about their union and how they hoped to satisfy their need for security. He came to like them as much as they liked him. And so when George came back to Princeton in the fall to finish his senior year, the economic and social facts had a new dimension. Now his research showed depth and understanding. Now his writing carried meaning and conviction. George is going into journalism at first, but chances are he'll end up in politics. These four are not unique. Somewhere along the line, most Princeton men have met with one teacher or more who deeply influenced their lives. Our friends will be leaving this year, but the pattern will remain. There will be other serious, hopeful young men to give and receive in the interplay of student and teacher that is higher education. More boys from Colorado and Kentucky, from Michigan and Mississippi, will come to regard Princeton as a threshold to a productive life. Princeton will grow as a fond memory in thousands of other hearts. Now perhaps we too can understand these memories. We too can see beyond the symbol to the experience for which it stands. We too can understand the pride that lasts a lifetime. More than a football victory is being celebrated, it is the whole institution, friends, classmates, teachers that are honored. For the Princeton man sees many things in the dancing flames of the victory bonfire. Without realizing it, he sees his own triumph over boyhood weakness. He senses the concepts that helped him to grow up. He envisions the ideals that attracted and held his loyalty. He remembers a group of his fellow men whom he respects and cherishes. And so in later years, when he comes back to visit old Nassau, he's coming back to more than a famous building. But it's easier to sing about a landmark than it is to talk about the relationship between a man and his teacher. And that relationship in the long run is what the four years of Princeton mean to our 25,000 living alumni. Behind the many symbols on this campus, there is an idea. It's the idea that Princeton stands for in American education. The idea that a university is a place where men of learning believe in young men of ambition and are given the opportunity to start them on their way.